Last night, as I was putting the final touches on this talk, I saw the NBA's new advertisement, We Are One, and it really resonated with me, especially in the context of this conversation. We are one. But getting to one requires more than just claiming it. It requires commitment, action, change. That doesn't always happen. Margaret Mead said, never doubt the ability of a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens to change the world, for that's the only way it's ever happened. I want to talk to you today about a diverse and small group of people who came together to change outcomes for families in the Eastlake neighborhood in Atlanta. Now, we live in a neighborhood, in a nation now, that's characterized by these huge divides across politics, across social issues, across economics. And these divides are reinforced by the media that we see every day. They're reinforced by the fact that most of us spend our time with PLU, people like us. We don't get beyond those folks. And while that may be comfortable, it creates an opportunity to reinforce our natural predispositions and our opinions, and doesn't necessarily challenge us to get beyond where we think we should be. Our government leaders fail to cross political and ideological divides to try to solve the problems that are trapping our country. Poverty is, in fact, one of those issues around which we have yet to create political will to create wonderful and sustainable change, at least at scale. 12.4 million Americans live in neighborhoods of concentrated poverty. 12.4 million in 4,000 neighborhoods around the country. That's a 72% increase in the population of high poverty neighborhoods since the, 19, uh, since the 2002 census. Poverty impacts children in a much more profound way. In fact, 86% of children who live in neighborhoods of concentrated poverty don't read at grade level by third grade, which is a really important and accurate metric in terms of predicting high school graduation rates, community health costs, and the number of prison cells that we're likely to need in 10 years. We spend $500 billion a year every year in the costs associated with childhood poverty. When Social Security started, there were 150 workers for every single recipient of Social Security. Now, there are 2.9 workers for every recipient. America needs every single one of us to become sophisticated, smart, effective workers in a knowledge-based economy if we're going to be successful as a nation going forward. This has to include the children who live in neighborhoods of concentrated poverty. But all is not lost. There is a pathway forward. And I want to tell you about the story of those of us who worked on the Eastlake revitalization and how we built bridges across these divides to create opportunities for families to break that cycle of poverty. Tom Cousins, Renee Lewis Glover, Eva Davis, and I all came from very different backgrounds. I worked for two of them called the third my adopted mother, and love them all. They are my heroes. Tom Cousins, as many of you know, is an Atlanta business legend. He founded Cousins Properties, which became one of the most successful real estate development companies in the Southeast, building some of Atlanta's most important real estate development projects, including the Bank of America Plaza, just a mile from here, which is the tallest building in North America outside of New York and Chicago. After 40 years of philanthropy, though, Tom was frustrated that he wasn't seeing the kinds of results that he had anticipated. He felt like the causes that he was supporting were more Band-Aids than cures. In 1993, he saw an op-ed piece in the New York Times that said 74% of the men in the New York State prison system came from just eight neighborhoods in New York City. Eight neighborhoods. He could not believe this. In fact, he picked up the phone and called the chief of police here in Atlanta and said, have you seen this shocking article? 
And if it's true, do we have the same situation here in Atlanta and in Georgia? And the chief said, oh, Tom, yes. Everybody knows this and went on to describe four or five neighborhoods that in fact had become pipelines into prison. He, the chief said the worst one of these neighborhoods was a neighborhood called East Lake. East Lake was in fact a neighborhood that had ceased to provide opportunities for families to buy into the American dream. Boys, if they were lucky enough to grow up, ended up in prison. Girls most likely ended up pregnant at 16 and destined to live in public housing for the rest of their lives. The housing stock was terrible. Fully half of the public housing apartments were uninhabitable. The crime rate was 18 times the national average. And every family was likely to be the victim of a felony every year. But it was around education. When we looked at education statistics that painted the very bleakest pictures, we saw that only 5% of fifth graders could pass the state math test and only 30% of young people graduated from high school. Eastlake had become a place that did not provide any possibilities. Tom and his family were compelled to do something to help in Eastlake, and they did something really unusual. Rather than start funding other organizations, they created their own nonprofit called the Eastlake Foundation to work with partners and neighbors to create the kinds of solutions that would solve the problems in the Eastlake neighborhood. About the same time, I went to work for the Atlanta Housing Authority as their deal lawyer. Uh, I was a commercial real estate lawyer, and uh, my job was to create the legal and financial model to do mixed-income housing. At that point, mixed-income housing was a really brand new idea, this concept of marrying up public and private dollars to create housing that would serve families beautifully across a broad range of income. Now it's a best practice, back in the day, a brand new idea. My friends and colleagues were really surprised when I left the private practice of law to go to work for an organization as broken as the Atlanta Housing Authority. But to me, it felt like I was getting back on the right path, that the previous 10 years of my legal practice had, in fact, not been the right path. When I was pregnant with my second child, Maggie, I was sick in bed, I threw up 50 times a day, and then went down with pneumonia. And that turned out to be an incredible blessing because it slowed me down enough to think about where my professional life was taking me. With the O.J. Simpson preliminary hearings and trial in the background of that pregnancy, I realized that I needed to make a major change in my life. Like many lawyers my age, um, To Kill a Mockingbird was absolutely an important part of driving me towards the law. I found the book when I was 10 years old on my kitchen table and sat down and read it five times straight through. I wanted to be like Atticus Finch. I wanted to be part of the team of people who were dealing with the hardest problems that we had, the part of the team that could be counted on to work through the things that were getting in the way of creating the kind of society where we all wanted to live in, what Doug Shipman referred to in his talk as the beloved community. So going to AHA wasn't really a new path for me, it was really getting me back on the path I wanted to be on. My boss was Renee Glover, who had just joined the Housing Authority. She was a public finance lawyer who uh, had grown up in segregated Jacksonville, Florida, the daughter of a prominent African-American family whose patriarch, Abraham Lewis Lincoln, was the first black millionaire in the state of Florida. Renee came to this job because she wanted to find a way to use the resources that the Housing Authority had to create wonderful opportunities for families, to create great neighborhoods with great homes. Things were starting to come together in Eastlake. We had a new Housing Authority leadership, and we had the Eastlake Foundation. But our first job was to build trust with Eva Davis, who is the president of the Eastlake Meadows Resident Association. Ms. Davis was the gatekeeper of the Eastlake neighborhood. In fact, a few years before, when Jimmy Carter had come to the community to hold a meeting in the neighborhood, nobody showed up. No one. His misstep, he failed to get Ms. Davis's blessing to have a meeting in her community. The problems of concentrated poverty were not theoretical to Ms. Davis. She had lived in those neighborhoods her whole life. She had been born in southwest Georgia um, to a single mother at the age of 15. Her grandfather gave her to the white sheriff when she was eight years old, ostensibly as the playmate for the sheriff's daughter. Miss Davis slept on a pallet in the little girl's room, took her meals in the kitchen while the family ate in the dining room, and 
I guess, left school when she was in eighth grade, soon after found herself pregnant and unwelcome in that sheriff's home. She moved to Atlanta, but life wasn't easy here either. But Miss Davis was a born leader. Miss Davis was the kind of person uh, who jumped into things. She jumped into the civil rights movement. She marched with Dr. King. She became uh, a plaintiff in the lawsuit that was designed to desegregate Atlanta's public schools. And when she moved into East Lake Meadows in 1970, she became the president of the East Lake Meadows Resident Association, the first, and I should say only, president that that organization ever had in its 40-year history. Miss um, Davis, the Resident Association, the, at least uh, the Atlanta Housing Authority and the East Lake Foundation planned, created a planning committee to come up with a new plan for East Lake. But before we could really get to the planning work, we had to build trust. We had to build relationships with one another. We didn't know each other before this work started. On the one hand, you had um, those of us from the Housing Authority, some nice new shiny people who just came to work for this organization who said, even though we hadn't been able to fix a toilet in 10 years, trust us on managing this revitalization process. And then on the other hand, you had Tom Cousins, this rich white real estate developer who shows up and says, hi, I'm from Buckhead and I'm here to help. <laughs> people were skeptical and they should have been. It took a while. We had to get to know each other. We had to build relationships in order for this to work. Um, as Ms. Davis said, I just had to get to know him and he had to get to know me. My job was to, in fact, build relationships with Ms. Davis and the other residents of the planning committee. And honestly, I didn't have a plan. Um, my only way forward was to be myself, to be transparent, and do what I said I was going to do. But a couple of things happened that showed me the way. The first thing happened when my son Connor, who was six years old, got sick one afternoon at school. I was headed out to Eastlake and got a phone call saying, come pick your little boy up. So I raced up to school, threw him in the back of the AHA van and said, how sick are you, sweetie? And he said, I feel better now that I've thrown up. So we went off to Eastlake and it turned out to be a great thing because all the residents there spent their afternoon loving on Connor and taking care of him and being sweet to him, but they changed how they looked at me. They looked at me as another mom, as somebody who was trying hard to balance work and professionalism. Um, they understood what I was going through. We were, in fact, one that minute. Had another instance. I have struggled with my weight my whole life. It has been a constant struggle for me. Um, at that point in Eastlake, I had reached the point where I didn't want to look in the mirror anymore and I started getting serious about losing some weight. And so the residents in Eastlake noticed, you know, we're meeting every week, and they noticed, hey, Carol, you're losing some weight. And so we started talking about weight, health, and stress. And the other women on the planning committee, many of whom also shared this struggle, we all, we all found support in one another. And it was that opportunity that made us, again, feel like we were one. They saw that I had more in common with them than not. It was an important lesson. So when I look back, I had to figure out that, aha, as much as I hate to admit it, it wasn't the fact that I was a great lawyer with a fabulous education and extraordinarily nego extraordinary negotiating skills that allowed me to build these relationships. It was the fact that I allowed myself to become vulnerable, that I let the shield of perfection down, that I let people see that I felt more like the guy in Ed Sullivan spinning plates on sticks than I wanted anybody to see. That idea that perfection, was get, perfection got in the way, but when people saw the great, big, messy, wonderful life I was leading, that created the opportunity for us to build relationships and ultimately trust. Through this planning process, we built an incredible plan for the community that included high-quality mixed-income housing, a cradle-through-college education pipeline, and high-quality health and wellness programs and facilities in the neighborhood. The Eastlake Foundation stepped up to a leadership role to ensure that the entire revitalization would take place as planned by the community. Tom stepped up and recruited civic and business leaders to become uh, board members of the Eastlake Foundation. And he found a way to save a historic and undervalued resource in the neighborhood, the Eastlake Golf Club, to save it from bankruptcy and redevelop it as, an ax as a way to create an income stream to support the neighborhood revitalization. 
the outcomes have been outstanding. Crime is down over 70%, violent crime is down over 90%. Incomes for families receiving the public housing subsidy are four times higher than they were back in 1995. But it's around education that we're most excited. We're seeing kids who go to our neighborhood school, Charles R. Drew Charter School, compete at the highest levels in the state. Our school that was once the lowest performing school in Atlanta now performs at par with the fancy pants schools on the north side of town that serve very few children with, uh, who come from families of poverty. Kids are doing great. Well, as a result of this success, um, we, we decided to start a new organization called Purpose Built, Built Communities. I've been lucky. I've worked on all sides of the East Lake revitalization, from the Housing Authority side to the East Lake side for eight years as the executive director. And now I work with these amazing people around the country who want to do the same thing that we did to create even playing fields in some of the very toughest neighborhoods in Atlanta uh, and beyond. Um, we're working now with 10 communities around the country and 20 more are going through this process to figure out whether this is the right fit for them. Miss Davis died two years ago. And I miss her every single day. She was really a remarkable person and I appreciate what she was able to do for both me and for the community every day. I realized that had she been born in a different place in time, she would have in fact been the CEO of the corporation, or she would have been the mayor of the city of Atlanta at the very least. She was really remarkable. So, as Margaret Mead said, never doubt that a small group of committed citizens can change the world. In fact, it's the only way it's ever happened. We found a pathway in Eastlake to build those kinds of relationships across the divides that frequently get in our way of getting us to where we want to be. We found a way to be the change in the community as one. Thank you very much.